Today, the Grinch who stole cash. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analysis, one of this post covering finance and property news. Today, I'm joined by Robbie Barwick from the Citizens Party in the new setting. Hi, Robbie, how are you doing? Uh, well, I'm mostly good, Martin. I'm actually pretty exhausted. <laughs> I've spent a couple of weeks moving house. And uh, as you can see behind me, we're not quite finished yet. Um, we are moved out. We haven't fully moved in. Um and I'm also exhausted because today is my birthday, and I'm not 21. I'm 49. <laughs> I'm feeling, <laughs> I'm feeling 79 after going from a desk job to two weeks of lugging boxes around and furniture. Um, I'm feeling every inch of my age plus more. Uh, anyway, so listen, because it's because it is my birthday, as usual, my airhead forgot that we had planned this tonight. So we're going to be really quick. And I always, Martin, and I always joke about how quick we're going to be, but tonight we're going to be pretty quick because I'm I'm supposed to be going out to a dinner in a little while. <laughs> um, but it, but this is so important we have to talk about it because there is a Grinch out there and she's going to try and steal our cash and a lot of other things if we don't stop her. And we're going to talk about that tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we can do it relatively quickly because these are really really important issues as we come up to the end of the year, and of course as we turn over into 2024, um, there is a critical opportunity to, to make sure that we actually stop what potentially could be quite disastrous in terms of ordinary Australians and how they go yep. about their affairs. And um, I'm afraid that the Reserve Bank is uh, very much in our target. Exactly. So, Martin, the three things I want to talk about tonight are um, Michelle Bullock, the Reserve Bank Governor, what she said about cash and the consequence of that. We want to talk about the new inquiry into the Jim Chalmers bill to hand over his power to Michelle Bullock. He has power that allows him to intervene and stop her if she becomes a technocratic monster and he's about to legislate it away and we have to stop that or else we will we will become um, a, a fascist bankocracy as Alan Kohler <laughs> turned it, a bankocracy. We need democracy over, over the financial system. The third thing is I do have a a backhanded compliment for the government because we have um uh i just want to describe this new bill that passed last week of parliament to set up a fledgling fairly small but nevertheless potentially very effective um development bank for australia which is a great um development and it's something we've been pushing for a long time so let's try and get through all that in half an hour and i think we'll be doing well absolutely <laughs> um, and, and sorry go let, ahead let me just say that that third point about the bill is is actually remarkable in a way but it was also hardly reported as well so i'm fascinated by the way that the media engages or doesn't engage around some of these yes. issues um the fact is that they don't tell the story the right way in my view they don't tell it from the point of view of ordinary australians and ordinary businesses you know and, and what, what i want to make sure we do is to highlight how critical these issues are for the future of everybody in Australia. No, exactly, exactly. So look, let, let's start on the cash question because that's what this this um, show's about. Um, we have this situation in Australia where this year, 2023, has become the year of the fight over cash. Now, the cash, the, the attacks on cash started long before that. But the reason I say 2023 is because we were able to get up and influence heavily this Senate inquiry into bank branch closures. And I've attended every hearing and the theme throughout all those hearings has been about has been about access to cash. We have had a, a what I see as a, a a dawning realization in the public about, whoa, we've gone pretty far down this technology route. And suddenly when something entirely um what, what should when the when the unexpected expected happens or the expected unexpected, I'm probably saying that, that wrong. You know what I mean though, right? Yes. The things that you can't predict that you should know are going to happen anyway, natural disasters, communications outages, et cetera, suddenly everyone's like, how can I spend money? I can't access it. If I, I wish I had cash. The small businesses who went cashless are putting up signs saying, please, we can only accept cash. Suddenly cash is is um, king again, right, for that emergency. And people have been sending me over the last 24 hours. The Channel 7 host, Natalie Barr, actually raised this 
in a in a television interview at news.com.au reported and it's like it's like it's a great insight it's just basic common sense hang on <laughs> whatever you're doing with technology isn't it important to keep the one thing that's reliable under all circumstances right so this is the debate has really broken out it's quite impressive i think that the media coverage of it they, we have a dynamic in the media now that when the media does cover something because they're always chasing eyeballs because of their economic model with the internet etc you can tell the, the the volume of coverage relates to the transact that sorry the traction that this issue is getting so the media is enthusiastic the politicians are therefore paying attention everyone's paying attention to this senate inquiry as i said to you last time i was told i think i said it to you last time we had meetings in canberra and um I, I, someone representing the government, a minister, said to us, "We're looking for implementables." So, you know, a, a, a total management term, government management term, implementables um, uh, from this inquiry, right? Because they know that there's a lot of growing concern out there. Um, mm. The people in North Queensland are going to be dealing with this right now because if you've seen the the, the weather yeah. disaster up there in Cairns, right? Um, you're gonna you're gonna they're going to be thinking, "Wish I had cash." By the way, Martin, our mutual friend Dale Webster. Did influence the emergency services in Victoria um, because there's always a, a broadcast before the um, before an expected you know a forecast event, um, whether it's a bushfire or something like that. And they say you know stock up on water, stock up on you know batteries, stock up on this. And and um, Dale Webster wrote to them and said you should actually be saying cash as well. I think it was the ABC she did, and the ABC started including that in their yes. um, in their announcement. Right, because you can't take it for granted, and suddenly, oh yeah, of course we should be saying stock up on cash as well. Make sure you got cash handy. Anyway, so this has been this has been a very very big year, and I think the that for those of us who've been following closely, the tide is is turning in terms of the dynamic between when the public start to become concerned about something and the um, the politicians start to pay attention. But you've got this these technocrats out there, Martin, and they're in the government, they're in the banks, and they're in the Reserve Bank, and they have been pushing an agenda. For a long time and they clearly do not want to give it up they are pushing hard with this and so the big thing in the last few weeks was first the reserve bank issued a paper based on a survey um claiming that cash use is plunging to an all-time low and at the rate it's plunging could be gone in three years that's what the what the takeaway headline of the survey was um the second thing was michelle bullock last week followed that up with a speech so First of all, I just want to show you some of the um, Reserve Bank website and the paper from her speech, which is information she's taken from the um, the survey. So this, th I'm taking this now from her speech, but this is from the paper from the survey. Now, before we go on, Martin, the survey is based on 999 people. And this is a survey they do every three years. See that? Hmm. So this is a consistent survey, but I was quite struck by the size of that sample because how does that compare with your sample? Well, interestingly, I have uh, 52,000 households in my sample continually. So I would say that 999 is at the very small end of, uh, of, 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 of sampling. And um, no, exactly. the, other, the other point is that if they only do it once every three years, what it means is you don't actually get, I think, enough continuous uh, feeds of information because I survey monthly, right? And so I can see some of those trends. Um, I, I have to say, very low number. Other point, of course, is they show it as a percentage, yes. a percentage, not the count. The transaction throughput's gone through the roof because, of course, many people are now using um, multiple um, smaller payments rather than bigger payments for all sorts of reasons. I could take you. I don't have night time now. I didn't queue it up. But if you can go, to, you can go to the Australian Banking Association website, and they have graphs there on the volume of transactions. And I can, and everyone loves using two thousand seven as a base for some reason. <laughs> I can tell you their graph of transactions from two thousand and seven has absolutely exploded from about 200 million a month in 2007 to 1.2 billion a month the last time I looked at it a few months ago 1.2 billion and one of the things that's happening and and there's some language in this in this paper that references it but I'm going to follow this up with some emails to the RBA authors and I'm demanding to know absolute numbers here um one of the things that's happening is 
the number of transactions, little transactions that are electronic have exploded because the, my, the expression I use is kids are tapping to buy $1 Slurpees at 7-Eleven, right? Yep. Instead of mum giving them a gold coin from her purse, they've got a phone or a card because they've been encouraged to get it and they wave it around like crazy. And every one of those transactions counts. And so there's a rule of statistics. If you see a percentage that doesn't, that isn't attached to absolute numbers, somewhere where you're getting scammed. And this has been the hallmark of what the banks and the bureaucracy have been raving about cash um, all year. Oh, the percentage of transactions has declined from over 60% cash in 2007 to over to 13% cash in 2022. I want to see the numbers because I know having traveled all around Australia, especially in regional Australia, they're using cash as, as much as they can. Um, they cannot, they are, what ha what's happened with the Optus outages, et cetera, was the testimony at the hearings was, this is what we deal with on a monthly basis, these kinds of outages, right? They know they have to ca have cash handy. And that's their biggest gripe about losing a bank branch because they lose the access to cash and the ability to bank cash. Um, so that's in the, in the country, in the cities, I went shopping the other day and I kid you not, I was in JB Hi-Fi, I was in Rebel Sport, these kind of places. People were paying in cash, right? I was quite, I was quite impressed with it. Now there is a apparently um, businesses have commented on this, politicians have commented on, on this. There is a growing public movement to use cash. People are proud. They go and waving cash. I'm one of them, right? They go and waving cash. They're, they're they're proud to use it. After we defeated the cash bear, remember Martin, we were saying use it or lose it. Right, you you've actually got to send that message that way, but nevertheless, what I'm so the bottom line here is I'm saying do not believe these kind of statistics; they're completely unreliable. But anyway, Michelle Bullock regurgitated this in her in her um, presentation. Now, before, we're going to play a clip from her presentation. Before we do, you got I had to show you this. So, cash access points, and look at so this is what the banks have done, right? Look how much it's plunged, um, and. This paragraph, though, up above is quite revealing. This is what she said in the speech. The declining use of cash is also challenging the provision of retail cash services. The declining use of cash is challenging. They're always putting. The, they're always saying the um, uh, the chicken coming before the egg, right? Or the you know. Anyway, it's late. I'm 49. Bear with my bear with my muddled metaphors. Um, then, then it goes on. This has been evident in a significant reduction in the number of cash access points over recent years, including ATMs and bank branches. Then look at this sentence. Despite this, the distance people need to travel to access cash services has been little changed in recent years. And the, the, the explanation for that curious fact, Martin, is right there in the graph. Because the banks have ripped out the ATMs. The banks have ripped out branches. They're shutting banks all over the place what has held the line the post office <laughs> the po and this is actually a a selling point for the post office they've done studies of this how the post office is structured so that everyone in australia is within well like 96 that's a figure this is this is from my memory a few years ago but it's like 96 percent of australians are within four kilometers or something of a post office mm -hmm. right something like that it's the post office that's held the line the government provider that has held the line on this. That's one of the reasons we, the Citizens Party, really strongly advocate a postal bank, right? The in, it's doing its job already. The infrastructure is there. Anyway, let's go to the Grinch, unless you've got something to add before we do. Well, just quickly, um, two points. Firstly, the real in interesting piece of information is what is the average transaction value via cash yeah. versus online? Um, I haven't seen any data on that recently, but knowing what I know they admit about it's the, going down. Yeah. So so the digital transaction is atomizing transactions, right? Absolutely. So you'll see a vast number of very low transactions. In fact, the average transaction in cash is holding its ground. And in fact, in my surveys, yes. it's actually gone up a little bit, particularly, interestingly, in regional areas. So because people are using cash more and because you know, there's little alternative. You can't use digital if you can't get technology to work out in the regions and what have you. In fact, cash is holding its ground 
in terms of the average transaction size or it's rising because of inflation. So that's another angle that is not covered in that RBA paper, which should have been. Absolutely. And but there but there's this language that they, they have to insert it to to acknowledge things like the volume the, the the average value of transactions is going down. They do acknowledge that, but they don't give you the actual data because I think it was the whole thing was a almost a deliberate fraud based on doing a survey when they could take the stats from the banking association if they wanted to, yeah. right? And actually have 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 solid numbers. They don't no one wants to do that. And I will say to the listener, trust Martin North survey over these RBA and government surveys and bank surveys every day of the week. Not just because it's such a huge sample, but it's consistently right. Um, our friend, Dale Webster, who's a professional journalist, we were talking about this this way of reporting. She's disgusted that the journalists don't... She was trained as a journalist. If you're given statistics like that, you ask for the absolute number. The journalists aren't asking for it, but the technocrats who wrote this paper, Martin, they should. They have a basic level of you know economic training and whatever. They know they're putting out something dodgy. Correct. They have to know it. Yeah. Right. Anyway, so then that, that then that allows Michelle Bullock to do this in the Q and A. So I'm just going to play the clip. Okay, here's a question we might tackle in the big debate as well. It's an interesting one. Do we need to start reflecting on the true cost of processing cash for businesses? and therefore not represented as a fee-free option for customers, while always charging customers when they use their credit card when, you know, there's no other option, really. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, look, it is um, a good question, and the issue with cash has always been that um, businesses don't really understand, I think, the costs of, of cash in their business. Um, uh, they are at the moment, I think, think uh, understanding it a bit more, um, but um, in the past they haven't really. Um, they've called shrinkage as their main cost, which basically means theft. Um, but really they haven't really um, internalised, if you like, the costs of processing. Um, I think what the challenge with cash is that it really does have a big community um, public's, public service sort of um, uh, aura attached to it. If you try to charge people to use cash, they're prepared to pay to get it out of an ATM, but if, if, um, if businesses started charging people to use cash, I suspect there would be um, a very big uh, backlash. Having said that, it's also true that as economists, you want people to face the prices of using particular services that reflect the cost of those services. So um, at the moment, I think we're probably in a position where um, it's very difficult to actually enforce payment for cash, but it's going to end up, what's going to happen and what does happen at the moment is that the costs end up embedded in the costs of the financial institutions that are providing the services um, and people don't face them. I think, I think it'd be a very big challenge though to get people to face the costs of cash. Because otherwise, if people aren't charged a surcharge, that means the people who don't use cash are subsidising the ones who do. This kind of this kind of logic. That's a remarkable, remarkable comment, isn't it? So three things. One is, well, of course, you've got to look at it from the economist's point of view. You know, um, uh, yeah. the people who use it should be paying it. So that's the neoliberal market. You yeah. know philosophy pays. A yeah. and the, and the third is oh we need to protect the bank's profits of course <laughs> the, the the businesses aren't aren't paying the cost of cash the financial institutions are the banks are that is their business, <laughs> <laughs> their business exactly is cash the business's business is supermarkets or mm. fast food or plumbing or whatever right i mean this this kind of mentality so look the, the Australia Institute, Martin, made a really great, um, a, 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 a genuinely very good submission to the RBA review, which we've just recently read. And one of the things they point out in there is how you, you need to see the RBA like the other regulators as effectively captured by the private banks. The Absolutely. same revolving door between the between the, the RBA and the industry, et cetera. This is shameless stuff. But then, yeah, the neoliberal idea of you break down everything into its component parts and unless every single part is making a profit in its own right and is priced accordingly, then it's no good. Get rid of it. 
That is insane. As, a, as a, an economist friend of mine joked, he said, why would you have kids? They're a cost center, right, in your family. Um, the we, we never, civilization never evolved with that kind of mentality. This is a deconstruction of civilization. They're smashing it down. It is the... Um, it is one of the most uh, banally evil, let me say that again, banally evil ideolo- ideologies that has ever existed, right? And it's absolutely nuts. And most people are turning away from it. We've had 30 years of this crap and people are going, you know, this, this is too much. But what the fact that she said it, the technocrats are still infected by this stuff. So, well, Robbie, just anyway, one, look, quick, one quick point. Those businesses who are taking electronic transactions have to pay for those electronic transactions, right? They actually pay the banks quite a lot. Um, yep. So that she's only talking about half the story here, not, not the other side of the story. So it's not like the digital transactions are free, right? The fact no, exactly. Of the, the fact of the matter is but, that there's an economic cost to those two. So she's not comparing apples, apples and, and pears, right? And the, the other point there is I'm getting stories now of individuals now being charged for some of their digital transactions by the banks as well. So they're starting mm. to actually use the digital. Now everyone's sort of using digital, so they've got no choice to actually start turning the volume up on, well, I'll make a bit more there as well. So, you know, you, you're caught once you're in the banking system, guess what? You'll be paying more. And and to contrast, Michelle Bullock, let me play you a little bit of the chairman of the Council of Small Business Organisations of Australia, um, Cosboa, at the Senate hearing on the 1st of December that I testified at. So we played a clip on our show, and I just want to play you that because – well, let me not preempt it. Just listen to his attitude on behalf of the small business community of Australia towards cash, and you can see why Bullock and the banks are gunning for it. Question about cash. Are, are members of COSBOA concerned about the loss of cash, or would, do they prefer cash, neutral on cash, especially in the regions? What's their view? Senator, I'm yet to meet a small business who doesn't like cash. <laughs> Cash will remain the cheapest way to transact. There is no other way around it. If you, if a, if a customer walks into a local supermarket with a hundred hundred dollar bill cash, it goes to the owner. That owner might then walk down to the um, local restaurant and buy a meal with that hundred dollars cash, uh, and you get this multiplier effect where you've all of a sudden you've generated two hundred or three hundred dollars. On the contrary. If we're talking about digital payments, and digital payments have their role, and I'm not a, I'm not a Luddite and I'm, and I'm none of that, but you did ask me the question. If that $100 is eroded at every transaction by one and a half, two, 2.2%, then there's a compound effect there. Yeah. 100 becomes 98 and a half, the 98 and a half becomes the 97, or whatever it might be. It, that, that is just the reality. There is a cost of transacting. And when you ask, um, our, you ask our small businesses, what's their biggest concern at the moment? It's the cost of doing business. There's a perfect storm of costs there. We're in a cost of living crisis, um, but we're also in a cost of doing business crisis. This doesn't get enough attention. It is extremely hard for people to churn out a profit. As I said, almost half of Australian small businesses aren't making a profit. High energy, high rent, high insurance, uh, and those merchant costs can, can add to that as well. So uh, long way of saying small businesses love cash. They love when customers come with cash. But equally, the ultimate goal is to delight their customers and where that is convenient for them to use tap and go, wherever it might be, of course, those provisions um, are available. But uh, there is absolutely cash is not dead in our view. Also, small business owners. Thank you, Mr. Akastrat. Small business owners uh, tend, to, tend to be self-selected in terms of being more independent, more um, considered, or considered risk more closely. And they can probably see that the need for for maintaining cash because it gives you control over your business. If, if... I, I think you, I, I think that's a very fair characterisation, Senator. You know, cash is king. You know, you don't need to have an MBA or have gone to business school to know that cash flow is the number one determinant for a business remaining in business, particularly in the current environment. 
and you only need to look at government programs that have sought to support small businesses, the most successful ones are the ones that got cash out the door sooner rather than later. You know, so there's all sorts of energy rebates and all sorts of incentive, which are welcomed and part of the policy mix, but um, certainly throughout the COVID period, grants, cash, you're absolutely right. And um, particularly for small businesses who uh, you know, may be carrying debt as well, um, whether that's through their small business being mortgaged against their residential premise, their house, um, holding cash in some sort of offset account uh, is absolutely um, vital there. Um, and then the concept of, of petty cash, of having card hold cash, yes, absolutely, uh, with the right safe, safety precautions um, being associated with that. Um, I know I mentioned it earlier, but the Optus example, Senator, uh, how, many, how many small businesses in this country for the first time in, in a long time said to their customers, hey, have you got cash on you? Uh, and they were probably underwhelmed with the response they got. So, uh, yes, you're right. Uh, small business owners take risk, they're entrepreneurial, uh, and that is probably why they appreciate the value of cash more than the next person. This is the man who represents small business in Australia, absolutely unequivocal. And it's the what is it? It's the cheapness of it. There's a cost of doing, as he talks about, there's a cost of doing business crisis in Australia. Cash is ticks all the boxes for small business. They know that. The banks know that. The Reserve Bank knows that. They are putting their thumb on the scale to make cash as big an expense as digital transactions. And they're telling us that this is the free market and we're all, we the consumer are dictating the direction of this. This is absolute rubbish. Um, now, for the sake of time, but we've set the say, I hope, I hope people have the, the Grinch, for the purpose of this discussion, has a name, Michelle Bullock. Let's just quickly then talk about the what we need people to do because, um, as, as I referenced earlier, the second thing, Jim Chalmers has introduced a bill where he's going to give up his power to intervene against that kind of technocratic idiocy to Michelle Bullock, the same Michelle Bullock. And this is, so we've talked about this before, but we've now got a Senate inquiry into it. And I just want to rattle off a few aspects of it that just to, to shape people, how people understand this. But please make an inquiry, a, a submission to this inquiry. We'll put the details below. Um, the, the submission's closed on the, on the um, we'll put a press link to our press release below. The, the submission's closed on the 2nd of February, though. Essentially, you need to think he has no right to do what he is proposing to do. Now, so this is a 72-year power. It was legislated by Ben Chifley and John Curtin and was legislated in the context of a fight over the te technocratic bankers and the elected government in the context of the Great Depression because the elected government knew that the bank had the, the government's own bank. They owned it. We, the people, owned it. The Commonwealth Bank had the power to put money out for public works projects that could, that could alleviate the 30% unemployment in Australia. And these bankers use inflation as the excuse, even though we had extreme deflation, these these bankers used inflation as the excuse not to do it. And so that led to the 1937 Royal Commission. The 1937 Royal Commission ruled that the government of the day, the elected government of the day, is the ultimate authority of the banking system. Robert Menzies refused to do anything with that ruling. But when John Curtin and Ben Chifley were in power in 1945, they legislated that power. And it's been there for 72 years. And the power has never been used. It's essentially a power that allows the treasurer of the day, representing the government, to overrule the central bank. It has never been used. So this is not something that's, that's an excessive power or, or anything like that. It's never been used. Yet the RBA review made it their number one recommendation to get rid of this power. We have since done a deep dive into the submissions to the RBA review, which is why we, we found the Australia Institute one I referenced earlier. We read all the submissions. None of the submissions recommended getting rid of this power. The paper they cited did not recommend getting rid of this power. It makes no sense at all that they've come up with this with, with this excuse to get rid of this power. Now, Malcolm Roberts, the, the senator who I played a second ago questioning the Cosboa chairman, he wrote an article for The Spectator making the point that Jim Chalmers was being Pontius Pilate here. He wants to wash his hands of responsibility of the fact that the Reserve Bank, after lying under Philip Lowe saying there will not be interest rate rises, has gone then gone and implemented the most savage ex, um, uh, interest rate rises in history in terms of the the speed at which they went from zero point one percent to four and a half percent, absolutely savage, crushing families all over Australia. 
And even though I've joined the ranks of the mortgaged, um, I'm not just, <laughs> this has always been my view. Um, uh, uh, you, uh, 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 Martin, I'll, you, you bear witness. Uh, uh, earlier in the year, uh, the, this time last year, John Adams and I had a debate on this channel, yes. right? And I argued against this approach, and John Adams argued for it. Um, uh, not that John John does not agree with what they're doing with the Reserve Bank powers, but he just he he was John's a big smashing with interest rates kind of guy. Mm. I was arguing the opposite, but it's one of those things where, as a technocrat, Michelle Bull first Philip Lowe, then Michelle Bullock's motivation is a number a kpi essentially that exists on their computer screen inflation of two to three percent and they feel justified in doing anything to reach that number including as michelle Pullett put it a few months ago in her own words she said in unemployment must rise to above four percent if we're going to get inflation within the target band that was another put another way in a less technocratic way. She was saying, "I will cause one hundred and forty thousand people to lose their jobs, potentially lose their homes, lose their relationships, lose their lose their 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 um families, whatever." Right? So I can meet the KPI that I've been given that's on my computer screen, and it's in circumstances like that that she is not accountable to the people. She's not elected, but Jim Chalmers is elected. And these are the circumstances where he he can't just get up there every time and interest rate interest rates go up and say, boo hoo hoo, I feel your pain. He has the power to do something and stop it and say to the RBA, you will address inflation in another way other than through interest rates. Because of course, they are also lying. There's two lies that have been told here about in raising rates. The first one was Philip Lowe saying there will not be any rate rises and a whole bunch of people went and borrowed money on assuming that right, no rate rises until 2024. Then he smashed them with rate rises. The second one was Michelle Lowe, Bullock keeps saying we only have one tool and that is patently false. The RBA has multiple tools. They have the power to direct the banks to reduce the amount of lending in areas of the economy that are too hot like the property market, and increase the amount of lending in areas of the economy that need investment, like the productive parts that can improve our supply chains so we can get cheaper fuel and cheaper electricity and all those sort of things that are contribute. Like she has the power to do that and they refuse to use it. She also has the power to differentiate the interest rate, Martin, between different sectors of the economy, right? She says you can charge them this much above the cash rate you can charge that sector this much above the cash rate because you want to incentivize the good and disincentivize the bad. She has the power to do that and refuses to use it. Instead, she does what Ben Chifley complained about in the 1937 Banking Royal Commission report. He wrote a dissenting report and he says he said this policy of raising rates on the people who are already in debt and smashing them, crushing them, is completely ineffective and doesn't seem to control inflation at all anyway, right? All it does is punish the people who are already in debt. We need to use other measures. Um, and that's why these powers came about. So the thing that for people to get in their mind is, here you have, you know, you can say, you can be cynical about the, the capacity for, for politicians to, to, to run the economy, all that kind of stuff that I keep getting back to me. But stuff it. The private banks haven't run it any better. Give me a break. We've had 25 years of absolute dysfunction. We've had 15 years since the GFC of completely nuts financial decision-making by private banks creating an, an insane speculative bubble. These so-called masterminds of the universe only thinking about maximize their profit every damn year. The guy who was head of whatever that was, um, uh, one of those... Um, you know, funds in 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 America uh, in, in in 2008 on a conference call saying, I foresee no circumstances in which our exposure to credit default swaps will be a problem, right? And two months later, it, his exposure to credit default swaps literally blew up the world, right? And he would have been on $50 million salary, probably $250 million salary. I don't know because all the stupid politicians and, and finance people would have been kissing that guy's ass saying, what a financial genius. You're telling me, oh, we can't have government people in government making decisions for the economy because they're no good compared to these other people? Crap. Utter, utter crap. The other people are no better. At least the ones in government we have a say over. We can do something about them.
But you can't do anything about the RBA governor. You can't do anything about the private bankers. That's why democracy in the financial system as a principle is very, very important. And this mental pygmy named Jim Chalmers is about to give it away. And as a principle, we go to war and crush countries in the name of democracy. Why are we sitting on our hands as we are giving up democracy over the financial system? And if you're as mad about that as I am, make a submission, please. It's very, very important. The details will be below. Don't wait till the 2nd of February. Go, go after this inquiry. It's very important we hit it with a lot of submissions because it's those things will send a shot across the bow to these guys and make them think twice. We've already, Martin, um, made the Liberals go wobbly. Jim Chalmers the other day complained. He thought he had a deal with Angus Taylor and because he didn't think Angus Taylor would support this inquiry, yet the Liberals did. And that's definitely because of the contact that we were generating, you know, people from your show, people, our supporters, et cetera, uh, lobbying people, you know, sending messages to Jim Chalmers, to, to Angus Taylor, to the local members of parliament, et cetera. The Liberals got the message and at least supported this inquiry. Now we have an opportunity to do something with it. So either we have the technocrats, who the, the Grinch who want to steal cash, in, totally in charge with no democratic say over them, or we protect this power at all costs. Help us fight to protect this power. Just quickly, Robbie, let me underscore one other point. The Baal International Agreement relating to capital, right, which is imposed top down through the BIS down into the banking systems in each country, has biased bank lending towards mortgages and away yep. from lending towards small businesses and, and, and other sectors because of, quote, the risk. Actually, what it enabled the banks to do was to maximise their use of their capital, right? So it's not only a matter of just leaving it to the neoliberal um, philosophical point of view. They've actually implemented implemented strategies top down through the yep. BIS down into the into the into the central banking system to bias lending in a particular way. So the point of the matter is, it could be different. It doesn't have to be like that. Right. But only if you actually use the power that the treasurer has to actually change the game. And, and I just get so worried about the fact that these technocrats are making all of the calls. And it's basically on my top down, a global view as to how to actually make economies work. It's warped. It's deceptive. It benefits the bankers. It doesn't benefit ordinary people. We've got to change it. Yeah, exactly. So please make make a submission. Very important. And a submission is just an email, right? But it's expresses your opinion as an Australian citizen. Do not, and, and I'll use this term that Alan Cole used before, where he said Australia is in the grip of a bankocracy. Yeah. We want democracy, not a bankocracy. And and if you understand how much struggle went into getting these powers in the first place, as I mean, our party, one of the things we do is do a lot of historical research on these kind of matters, right? We've, we've pretty much written the book on it. Um, <laughs> You would, you would not give this one up. And so you as a citizen can express that. We'll put the link to our press release. Use your own words. We've got plenty of information there. Follow the links. But please make a submission. If you can whip one out, um, just as an email to the committee with the detail, contact details there. If you can whip one out this week before Christmas, that'd be great because then you won't have to. I'll, I will be back on Martin's show in January to remind you, <laughs> right? But um, <laughs> don't put it off. Get it out there. Um, now, Martin, one last, one, one last thing on a positive note. Okay, so this is the Mandarin, and this came out last week. The authors of this article are not journalists. So in other words, the, the media actually hasn't covered this issue in terms of the journalists. This is a Union University of New South Wales professor, Elizabeth Thurban, and Oliver Yates is the former head of the, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. But essentially, um, this is quite an insightful article, The Immense Power and Importance of Australia's new, Newest Bank. On November 27, the Commonwealth passed one of the most important pieces of legislation of 2023 with surprisingly little public comment. It was the National Reconstruction Fund Investment Mandate Directions 2023, the NRF Act. The NRF Act called into being Australia's new National Development Bank. Now, that's the that's the author's term. That is not the government's term. And that's one of the reasons that if, we had, if the government had said, look, we're setting up a National Development Bank, we would have noticed. They called it this, this reconstruction fund. Nevertheless, 
the author the authors have good insights into this. Um, one of the most important institutions a government can have, development banks give policymakers the power to mobilise finance and channel it towards crucial national missions. The primary mission of the National Re- um, Reconstruction Fund, as stipulated in the Act, is to strengthen the nation's manufacturing base and to build and grow globally competitive, export-ready uh, firms in the high-tech industries of the future. Um Development banks are always important for governments, especially those with ambitious visions for national progress. I won't read the rest of it, but you can put the link to that below as well. So I, I went through, I was blown away by this because <laughs> how come our party of all parties <laughs> wasn't aware this was being passed, but essentially no one was. When Albanese announced this policy before the election, we had actually criticised it, and justifiably so, because it was so weak. This is a very small thing they've set up. It's about $15 billion. If you want a real development bank, you're going to go bigger than that. There's, the need is is so is so great. However, it's scalable, and and in 2020, you'd remember Martin when the when COVID hit and the lockdowns happened, etc. We were scrambling like everyone in Australia was. All the people in government were complaining. Oh, we don't have look. We're, we're at the mercy of these global supply chains, and they're all collapsing. What do we do? Well, what? How come? How bad is it? We don't manufacture for ourselves anymore. And we said you, this is the opportunity to seize. We have to. Um, make the turnaround now. What can we grab now to scale up to pr- to provide the kind of public investment we need? And we identified the Clean Energy Finance Corporation was a government lender that could be scaled up, right? And we tried to do it, and we got blocked in certain ways. But nevertheless, that was the kernel of the idea. Um, one of the obstacles to that particular idea being scaled up is is the people who set it up. They wanted it only for green technology. Not not go beyond that, right? They were they were pretty, in a sense, ideological about it. But I know why they did it. Anyway, this is essentially the broader version that we wanted. What they have now passed is the broader version that we wanted. Now, there's a few there's a few you know conditions in there to placate the neoliberals. It's got to it's got to return two to three percent above the the government's five year bond rate. This kind of stuff. Um, nevertheless, that can all be dealt with. If you actually muscle the investment that is that Australia is crying out for, right? Not in mortgages in the capital cities, but in the the, the smart entrepreneurial people who are coming up with with um, manufacturing ideas. As one guy described it to me in 2020, he said, "Look, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of small engineering firms out there in Australia, and the guy the guys who run these firms they're really good at fiddling with their hands. They've all got these good ideas. They're no good with money." Right, he said they're good with their hands. If and and the government had just spent at that time, what did uh, I forget what job keeper cost? Like it was like twenty billion dollars or something, right? And, yeah. and my friend, my friend in engineering said, look, if you if you took five billion dollars and you shared it among the these engineering firms, you said you said to them, okay, here's money. You can't spend it on cars and houses, but get your ideas to a production level. And he said a lot of them won't really go anywhere but and some will fail some will succeed and be pretty good but he said 10 will become as big as bhp right that's the kind of potential that's there and it just needs this kind of backing but the people who run the the people who control credit in australia the ceos of the big four banks they have no vision for that and the government has no vision because they up until now they've left all that decision making up to the ceos of the big four banks right and and the reserve bank doesn't want to do it we want them to do it they don't want to do it but under different kinds of thinking, they've come up with this. And like I'm saying, what I'm talking about, I'm trying to be, I'm not, I am being positive. You might think it's unusual me being positive about a current government policy. I'm being positive because of the potential, because it's scalable. That's what people have got to see. We have a lending institution now. And it means the, the excuses that Chalmers trying to make for himself with the RBA bill, washing his hands of responsibility. Um, Ed Husick, the industry minister who pushed this bill through, has now given the government back the responsibility again. We can say, you have no excuse. You have a tool there you could be using to develop Australia, right? Scale it up and use it. The country is desperately crying out for that kind of investment. And so it's a, it's actually, for 2023, it's a very, very positive development. If the potential is realised, that's one thing we have to fight for. Absolutely. And if you look back over 2023, you know, the the inquiry into cash, the um, development bank we've just spoken about, positive ticks, but also the negative 
you know, in terms of the neoliberal philosophy and uh, people trying to walk away from stuff that's so critical in terms of, you know, steering the economy and steering the future in to the benefit of ordinary Australians and businesses. That's the critical story. That's going to be the agenda for 2024. And once again, we should celebrate the submissions from individuals who've watched your shows and, 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 our, and my shows, our shows. They have made a huge, huge, huge difference to what's going Absolutely. on. It's really important to continue the fight and to continue the communication with our politicians because they do listen. And when they realise just the amount of power and pressure there is in the community for the positive change that we can see and, you know, we we, we know what the route should be, um, I think the next few months will be very interesting and we'll have another show early in the new year to just cement the agenda for 2024. But um, really important conversation, Robbie. And uh, on the day of your birthday, um, you've gone way over the 30 minutes target, but, hey, <laughs> uh, no surprise there. But um, enjoy, the rest the, enjoy the rest of the evening. And I just want to say, right, you know, these issues are so critical and graduates at the time to talk about them today. No, thanks, Martin, and thanks for all the work you do as well. It's been a great year. Um, so, yeah, we'll get together in January and get everyone oriented for 2024. Have a good Christmas, everybody, and make a submission. Spot on. See you, Robbie. Have a good See Christmas, you, New Year. See ya.